Welcome to the Summit for Wellness podcast, where we help you climb to the peak of your health. And now, here is your host, Brian Carroll. We've all seen the videos of animals that are stuck in trash, or that sea turtle that had the straw stuck in its nose. And I think we can all agree that these videos are very sad, but how can we help reduce the overall consumption of single-use items? What's up everyone, I'm Brian Carroll, and I'm here to help people who have an injury or illness that holds them back from enjoying the outdoors. And I think we can all agree that we want to help the planet to be in better condition when we leave than when we arrived. But the big question is, where do we start? When preparing for this episode, I was trying to think of all the different products we use every single day that are either single use or doesn't break down very easily. So in this episode, we will walk through a lot of everyday items and how we can find better options that are more eco-friendly. But before we dive into this episode, right now I am collecting information about what you like and will love to see changed with this podcast. So by taking the survey, you will be automatically entered to win a $100 gift card to a place of your choosing. That way, you can choose to support whatever business you would like. So to fill out the survey, go to summitforwellness.com survey, and it should take you less than two minutes to complete. Now, let's dive into my conversation with Stephanie Lacoven. Stephanie Lacoven is a certified nutritionist and registered dietitian who has been working with passion since 2005 on creating systemic change around environmental sustainability, food systems, human health, and nutrition. She maintained a private nutrition practice for almost 10 years and taught nutrition at several local community colleges before shifting her focus from private practice to leadership, wellness, and sustainability in the Lake Washington School District in 2015. Thank you for coming on to the show, Stephanie. Thanks for having me. Of course. And I definitely think this is a, a topic that we should be talking about a lot more, especially since there's all the talk around climate uh, change and people are looking for more ways to just have a more sustainable uh, practices in their daily life. And I, I think this is a topic that, um, you know, even if we can make small changes, it's going to go a long ways when we have seven plus billion people on this planet. So I'm excited to talk to you more about different ways to start integrating more sustainable practices in our lives. But before we do that, can we dive into your background a little bit and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, being a nutritionist and a registered dietitian and some of the projects that you've been working on? Well, I became a certified nutritionist through Bastyr University here in the Seattle area. Um, in 2004, I got my master's in 2004 in nutrition, and um, I became a registered dietitian in 2005. And I was in private practice for about 10 years, working with people on modifying their diets and taking them on food shopping tours and doing kitchen makeovers. And I loved that work. Um, it was really terrific. And I worked a lot with low income people who are on limited incomes and people who are elderly or disabled. Um, and um, it was very fulfilling, uh, but my background prior to that was in environmental studies, uh, and I found that what where my interest just kept shifting uh, was toward environmental sustainability. And so I started working um, just little bit by bit um, with our school district um, on in on trying to incorporate different aspects of sustainability into different schools. Um, so it started with some pilot projects where um, I would work more from the angle of nutrition, but also looking at um, healthier food systems. And that's a whole other topic. Um, but um, really, I then got into working with PTA, PTSA, so the Parent Teacher Association, or, or it's also called PTSA, Parent Teacher Student Association. And um, that is the largest child advocacy organization in the country. And I became a PTA, PTSA president. And the whole time I was doing that, I, I loved it. But the whole time I was doing that, I was really also trying to work the sustainability angle with the school where where I was volunteering. Um, and bit by bit, the culture of the school um, started changing, you know, partly 
I suppose, from the work I was doing, but also because times are changing and people are seeing that there's a real need for substantive changes, not just, you know, little bit by bit, but either a little bit by bit, but on a huge collective impact level, um, but also at a, a, on a larger scale with policy. And so um, here I am today, and I can talk a little bit also about uh, through PTSA, the positions that we've developed and, and where we're going with that. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about the work that you're doing in the school district a little bit later on, because from my understanding, uh, it can be very difficult to uh, make changes in school districts um, just because of resources available and costs and whatnot. And uh, I think a good example of that was uh, Jamie Oliver years ago, probably over a decade ago, trying to make some changes. Um, I forget what state that was, what city that was, but there was a lot of resistance. And I think uh, big changes cause a lot of resistance, which is why in this episode, I want to talk more about small changes that we can start to make, because I think uh, if you make too drastic of a change right off the bat, then uh, that's a less sustainable approach for uh, individual people. Um, so making the small changes, I think, can have more drastic uh, measures in the long run. So uh, since we're talking about sustainable practices, can you give us a good definition of what sustainable is? Um, sure. So uh, sustainability is, is often defined as meeting the needs of the current generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So on sort of a practical level, um, living a more sustainable lifestyle would involve making decisions about what we eat, what we buy, the energy we use, the, um, the items we throw away. Um, you know, making decisions that are guided through a lens of sustainability. Um, so you're thinking about the life cycle of, let's say, a product. So if you're, if you need water, you're thinking about getting your stainless steel water bottle and refilling it rather than going to Costco and getting, you know, a 24 pack of single use water bottles because you're thinking about where those water bottles going after, after I use them. And um, since you mentioned meeting the needs of current generations without compromising the ability of future generations, um, like when plastic started to become a really big thing, at that point, people didn't really understand like the long term impacts that having all these plastics in the world can do. So uh, how can we now look ahead 20, 30, 40 years to see what type of uh, impact what we're doing now can have on the future? Well, that's what people are doing now. I mean, that's what scientists are doing. And they are making projections, predictions that um, that don't give us 30 or 40 years. I mean, they're, they're giving us 10 to 12 years before we not before all of a sudden everything is <laughs> shot to hell, but before the damage that we've done will be irreparable. So, you know, while, while I do, I've been working with school districts for a while and also as a nutritionist for a while. And so I know that often people can get overwhelmed by the idea of these huge changes and making huge changes all at once. It makes Sometimes that and the whole idea of climate change for a lot of people, I think, can be so overwhelming that they feel incapacitated by the enormity of it. And so we definitely don't I mean, in, in the work that I do, I definitely don't want to do that. But I think that the time has really passed for the mindset to be, oh, if I just, you know, make this tiny little change or make that tiny little change, but I go along with life as usual, that everything's going to be OK. Because it's it's <laughs> that's not really what um, what scientists, what a huge majority of scientists are telling us. They're telling us that the time is now to make significant changes. Now, can we take those changes and boil them down and and have them be a little bit more gradual in our daily lives? Absolutely. You know, you don't have to start with completely revolutionizing your whole life tomorrow. Um, I think there are definitely ways to uh, incorporate changes. You know gradually but we are needing to kind of fast track them and this is all for this isn't like for me i'm 47 this isn't as much for me this is for my children this is for everybody's children and for their children and so um i think we need to understand that um, 
gaining a heightened consciousness around this and start think, starting to think about things through the sustainability lens um, is, is something that at some point soon is not really going to be optional. So we might as well start to incorporate the changes, you know, as quickly as we can and on a, a level that will um, have the greatest impact not focusing on the things as much maybe that won't have the greatest impact, but focusing on the things that will have the greatest impact um, so that we can um, change that consciousness, change our culture um, around waste and around pollution and around life cycle of things. And, you know, there is a um, someone named Paul Hawken um, uh, edited a, a book called Drawdown. He wrote a book called Drawdown. It's um, the um, subheading on that is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reduce global warming. And um, that was published in 2017. And, you know, it's kind of, I have all the sustainability chairs at the schools that I work with. I recommend that everybody get the book to, it's not one that you just sit down, you know, poolside to read cover to cover. Um, but you can, but it's really, really well referenced and very well done. And it goes through the, um, those changes that can be made to have the greatest impact on climate change. Um, and so two of the top um, things on that list, and they list a hundred things that can be done. And some of them are not things that you and I are doing, right? Some of those things are um, have to do with like global systems or national systems, but, um, but some of those things uh, are some of the top things, two of the top things are related to, to us and our daily decisions. And those are um, around food choices and food waste. So I, I do recommend that book for anybody interested in really diving into this. So a couple of decades ago, we had the big push for uh, recycling. We had the reduce, reuse, recycle, repeat. Um, and now we have sustainability. Are they one and the same or is there differences between the two? I think that sustainability incorporates a lot, you know, a lot more than just reduce, reuse, recycle. Um, but I would say that, let's say in a school district, but I can also say that if, if I were counseling somebody, let's say about sustainability in their life, um, that I would put, re I would really put reduce as a reduce and reuse at the top. And then recycle is, uh, you know, recycling is great, but we've got a major, major issue globally with recycling too now, especially with recycling plastics. Since we can't send our plastics off to China anymore, um, there's a major issue with recycling. And so um, I would say that reducing is number one, you know, reusing is number two. And those are two of the top things that you can do in your daily life um, in order, you know, to help reduce waste and reduce the impact on climate change. It really comes down to the impact on climate change because all of these sustainability issues do impact climate change. And that's what most greatly affects our survival. And I don't know if you know the answer to this question. It just popped in my head, but um, during the process of uh, converting recycled uh, plastics into other products, does um, does that end up causing more microplastics that somehow get into the environment and can actually cause more damage to the the environment by losing track of all those microplastics? Um, I haven't heard that. I haven't heard that in the recycling process that microplastic pollution has caused. Um, there are a lot of things causing microplastic pollution, though, and things that, that people can directly impact by their choices in, in what to do. Things like just never buy or use glitter. Glitter is just bad. <laughs> it is a disaster. And most schools have a ton of glitter. Um, preschools, especially, you know, like daycare, all of them, like lots of people like to use glitter. It's really bad. It gets into the environment. And you can't really filter that out. Um, similarly, um, uh, microfiber, you know, we, uh, microfiber causes microplastic pollution. And that's a lot of what people buy with clothing and with rags. I mean, I started a green cleaning program at our school, not really, and I was like the head of sustainability and I didn't realize that I shouldn't be using microfiber cloths for the green cleaning program. That's what was recommended by the Department of Health. And so 
we ordered all these microfiber cleaning cloths. And then it, a, one of the sustainability chairs at one of the schools uh, brought it to my attention. And oh my goodness, I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So now we're not, now we're using, you know, repurposed rags um, rather than microfiber cleaning cloths. So there are a lot of places, but, but basically with plastic, um, when you dispose of plastic, a lot of it ends up in the ocean and it, um, it takes so long for it to break down, but as it's breaking down, it's getting into smaller and smaller pieces and pieces that you can't just pick up. Not that you can even pick up the enormity of the plastic that's in the ocean because there's so, so much of it, but it does get smaller and smaller and smaller and it gets into everything. Yeah, there's some large operations going on to try and clean up the ocean and all they're doing right now is trying to clean up the big debris and it's taking billions or even trillions of dollars just to clean up the big stuff, let alone the the tiny micro particles. So I think once it gets to a certain size, I don't think we really have a chance of being able to clean it all up, at least not with what we currently have um, in place for uh, cleaning up pollution. But right. um, well, and and on, on that note, you know, you're trying to clean it up from one end while the producers are producing it at the other end. And not, you know, not just a little bit, they're, this is, you know, what a several trillion dollar industry from what, from what I can remember. A $4 trillion industry, I think is the plastics industry. Um, and they generate more than 300 million tons of plastic a year. Um, so, and about half of that is for single use items. So, you know, you can pull it out, but it doesn't really make sense if you're pulling it out only to be, be replacing it. Right. And since you just mentioned uh, single use items, let's dive into some common everyday items that people use. And what are some ways that people can replace it with a more uh, sustainable option? So since you already talked about microfiber um, and cloths, let's start right there with clothing. Great. So I recommend that people hit up the Goodwill or the Value Village or, you know, any used clothing stores, consignment stores. There are some, I have some amazing clothes that came from uh, consignment stores or from Goodwill. And, um, you know, one, what one person is done with or has outgrown or, what, you know, whatever, it, it can serve as great clothing for somebody else, especially when it comes to children. So not buying new is one thing. Um, you know, another thing is donating your your own used clothing or giving it to friends or doing clothing swaps, um, not buying microfiber. So choosing fabrics that are um, natural fabrics. Um, those are a couple of ideas. And since you are in the school system and typically at high schools, you have uh, dances. What, what are some good ways um, to... Uh, have better options for um, clothing for dances since a lot of times those are just single use? I would say reaching out to other, either going to a place like Goodwill and finding something, you know, that, I mean, it's so inexpensive, you know, you could get a whole outfit for 10 bucks. <laughs> and so that's one way to go. Um, another is just borrowing from friends, you know, knowing people in your community. I mean, it has a lot of benefits, but one of the benefits is if, if you live in a community where um, there are, you know, here in Kirkland, Washington, we have Buy Nothing Kirkland, a Facebook group. We have um, Next Door. We have, you know, all these online forums where you can post something. And pretty much the minute someone posts, someone who needs something posts, someone is responding saying, hey, I have that. Or yeah, you, if you can, you can borrow that. Or here, I've, I forgot that I had that. And you can, you know, I found it and you can have it. So um, I think reaching out to your kids' friends or to their, you know, in their community, in your community can be helpful. And I'm assuming there's probably places you can rent dresses and whatnot as well. Because uh, I know you can rent like tuxedos or suits. So I would assume it's the same for dresses. Yes, it is. And I haven't done this, but I do have friends who for, you know, very fancy occasions, they've um, ordered dresses. I would have, I can find the link. I don't remember the name of the, the company, um, but you've ordered in your size and it gets delivered to your house and you've got a fancy new dress that <laughs> you then return at the end. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, so another everyday item that a lot of people use are Ziploc 
bags. So what's a good uh, way to replace those? Okay, so if you, uh, f- first I recommend um, using a reusable container if you can. Um, a lot of people send their kids food to school in a Ziploc bag um, or you know to sports or whatever. If you know you're going to be getting it back and you can train your kids to bring it back, um, I recommend using stainless steel containers if possible. Um, But if not, I mean, there are times when you know you're not going to be getting it back. So there are um, bag, different types of bags that are compostable. Um, And one example is called bio bag. Um, Another is called lunch skins, Um, but we can post all of this. Um, There's also for our, um, in our area, Cedar Grove Compact, Composting has, and I know this will be a link, has um, a list of um, different items that they take and that they recommend. And so anybody can really look on that list because I imagine that some of the items are made by Ziploc. So you could just look and then order it on, you know, through through another vendor. Um, but there are just, there's so many options now um, of compostables so you don't have to use single-use plastic. Is paper a good option or... Um... Is that not as environmentally friendly? Um, I think paper is definitely a better option than plastic, but reusable is a better option than all of them. So I I definitely recommend that. So a lot of times people will get grocery bags, like the plastic grocery bags, and then they will reuse them as garbage bags. Uh, So what's a good uh, alternative option to um, using plastic bags for garbage? Okay, so... Um, this one's a little bit tricky in that, um, you know, the recycling, I think you can put direct, like we have a trash bin, a recycling bin, a compost bin, um, and the compost bin we can line with a compostable liner. The uh, recycling, I don't even line. I just put our recyclables in there and then I dump them in our larger recycling bin and I just wipe it out. Um the trash bin um, is a little bit different. There, you can use a compostable liner. Um, they tend not to be quite as durable, um, and so I would say that. And I'm open to suggestions if anybody has another suggestion. But um, what I've noticed is it kind of comes down to the least harmful of the options. Um, definitely reusing another bag is a good idea. Although I I highly encourage people never to accept a plastic bag when they're out, but to bring their own uh, reusable bags. Um, But if you're using a garbage bag, first of all, I would highly recommend that you not get any sort of garbage bag with a scent on it, um, because that scent um, is a chemical that can cause asthma and hormone disruption and all, you know, cancer. I mean, there, there are a lot of, there are compounds that are very unhealthy in anything that's scented. Um, and some of those garbage bags are heavily scented. Um, and then just find the garbage bag that has the least amount of plastic. Um, and again, on that Cedar Grove website, they have some recommendations of garbage bags, but you know, like the, the big dark colored plastic bags tend to be like really big. So only use that if you have a really large trash can and use something smaller if you have a smaller trash can. Right. And then you uh, mentioned earlier about getting bottled water and swapping that out. Uh, What are some good ways to swap out the bottled water? And also um, from a health perspective, are there any issues with drinking bottled water? There are definitely issues with drinking bottled water. Um, A 2018 study found microplastics in 93% of bottled water that was tested. That was 259 bottles of 11 brands of water that were tested. So people have a real misconception that drinking bottled water is a healthier thing to do, which I would argue is it's not. Um, And environmentally, it's just a disaster. I mean, it's a disaster. It will take you five seconds to do an online search on the effects of plastic water bottles and their caps on, on marine life. It is, the pictures are just horrendous. And so um, I think that getting single use plastic water bottles, Gatorade bottles, you know, all of that, I think getting those out is really important and um, using a uh, either stainless steel or glass or some, some sort of, non-plastic water bottle. I mean, it's better to have a 
if your only option is a plastic reusable water bottle, then use that. But I would um, argue that it's worth the investment to get a stainless steel water bottle if possible. Um, and you just reuse it wherever you go. Like if you can go to, if, if I'm traveling, I bring it along, I bring it to the airport empty. And now our airport at least has uh, water refill stations. So once I go through security, I refill my water bottle. When I'm, I mean, we went, uh, traveled around Costa Rica and brought our water bottles and we'd go to restaurants and just refill our water bottles at the restaurant. So um, we didn't need to buy uh, new plastic water bottles. Um, the other thing is um, with coffee cups, uh, at least around here in the Seattle area, everyone goes out and gets their coffee and all those coffee cups end up in a landfill and the lid, the plastic lids end up in the landfill. So um, I recommend getting a, um, you know, stainless insulated uh, coffee cup if you can um, and never using plastic straws. First of all, you never want to put like a plastic straw in your hot drink because then you're just getting more plastic into your body. Um, but also plastic straws are harming marine life just terribly as well. So there are compostable straws. There are straws made of avocado pits. There are straws made from paper. Um, the avocado pit ones seem to hold up quite well. Um, and we can post that link as well. Yeah, I haven't heard of avocado pit straws before, so that's neat. I'll have to look into that. But I have been using a glass bottle for about 10 years now. And um, I just retired the first one I got, and I had that for over nine years. So they last a long time, and that's wow. with dropping them. A lot of people think that, oh, if you drop it or something, then they're easy to break. They don't break that easy, surprisingly. That's, that's incredible. And, you know, I... I um, do recommend if you get a reusable water bottle that you get one of those brushes that can get like a baby bottle brush that can go inside and clean it <laughs> because I've seen some pretty gross <laughs> water bottles um, and you don't want to get sick. So just making sure you keep it clean. It just becomes, you know, it, it's, it's seems like a little change. You have been using a glass water bottle for 10 years. Just imagine how many plastic water bottles you have saved. I mean, you one person, I mean, thousands of water bottles, and that's from one person you have, you have saved that. So any one person can have that much of an impact. So I really encourage people to take that step. It might seem like a big deal, but you just get used to it. It's not a big deal. And I have a follow-up question with that. Um, so, cause sometimes when you go to certain cities and I'll just say there might be a certain city called Seattle that has terrible drinking water. Um, and a couple weeks ago I was at a sporting event there and we bring our water bottles so that we can fill up in the stadiums and the water tastes terrible. So we end up not drinking the water at all. Um, if you live in a place that has, um, very chlorinated water or water that does not have um, or taste very good for drinking. What are some good options to get good quality water so that you have um, a high quality of water for drinking? I would say that having a water filter for home is um, ideal because a, a lot of people will drink a majority of their water from home. Um, and so uh, we use it in our home. We use a Berkey uh, water filter, and that's a local company here in Redmond. And they uh, their filters work great, and I love our water. Um, but there are tons of different options in terms of um, great water filters. Now, um, there are also um, some. I, I don't have these, but there are some water bottles that have um, built-in filters. So you could refill the water from, you know, a tap that maybe it, it's heavily chlorinated or it just doesn't taste good and it will be filtering the water that you're drinking. So that's um, always an option as well. Do you know if Berkey removes um, plastic particles at all? Um, I think it does. I would have to double check. The research I did was, um, we've had it for a few years. So the research I did was a few years ago. I would have to double check. Um, and, and so the other thing is you can look, um, the environmental working group has, um, it's ewg.org and they, um, just released a tap water database of 
you know, lots of different parts of the country and um, the chemicals, lots of different cities and the chemicals that you need to be concerned with in each of those areas um, in terms of the public drinking water. So you can go in and very easily figure out what chemicals might be of concern in your specific city. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic resource. And uh, just so everyone knows, all of these resources are going to be at summitforwellness.com slash 94. And we're going to have a whole list of different resources. So you don't have to remember all of this information. It'll be right there in the show notes. Um, let's dive into, uh, let's talk about plastic silverware. So if you go out to uh, grocery stores or places like that, a lot of times they have plastic silverware and you're eating that with um, usually um, warm food, which probably is not good because you'll leach out uh, the plastics into your food that way. But what are some good alternatives to the plastic silverware that places provide? Um, so you could be a total nerd about this like I am and you could bring your silverware um, and bring durable silverware or even compostable silverware. Um, uh, but it's not, a, a lot of people now might bring uh, stainless steel straws with them um, to be able to use those. And you can, just like you can bring your water bottle, you can also bring um, your silverware. And, you know, those they sell little um, kind of, uh, nicely presented, uh, durable silverware that is kind of for on the go, but you don't really need to buy anything special. Just take a fork and spoon and knife from your stash at home and, um, and bring it along if you want. And a lot of places also will have durable. You just have to ask for them. So if, if, um, you know, I were to go to a place to get a coffee and, you know, I'm bringing my stainless steel cup. Oh, great. And then all they have out are plastic stirrers or plastic spoons. I'm not putting that in my hot coffee. And so they will have durable in, you know, behind the counter. So I will just ask for one and they will always give it to me um, to use. And mo a, a lot of places will have that as well, but you can always bring your own too. There are certain things, there are certain um, items like this that are, um, that just require a little bit more planning and a little bit more thinking. And if you're not used to having to think about these things, it just takes a little bit of time. Um, so you might not do it every time. Maybe you'll just do it 10% of the time and then 25% of the time. And then, then you just get used to it and it becomes a habit. Awesome. And then a lot of uh, grocery stores, they wrap uh, let's say meat products in styrofoam or plastic um, to help kind of keep uh, the germs off of the meat and keep it a little bit more preserved when it's sitting out. What are some alternative ways to uh, get products like meat so that you're not dealing with the plastics in the styrofoam? Um, it might depend on where you go. If you um, If you can shop at a local butcher, that's even better because I would think that you could bring your own container to a local butcher and they would use it or they would maybe wrap it in paper for you. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to Safeway or any kind of standard um, market um, and, it's, and it's already packaged and it's packaged in styrofoam with plastic, um, I, you can ask them if they can package it in something else uh, for you, but it's kind of already done. But I think the value of speaking up is if you don't speak up, they don't know that it's important to you or important to anybody. So if you say something to them and ask them, ask the, you know, the meat department manager, ask the manager of the store, um, just tell them that this is a value that, you know, that one of their customers shares and have your friends say the same thing. You'd be shocked. I mean, stores do often listen to their customers. Um, and so I would say, just talk to them about it and tell them why it's important to you. And then what about products for cleaning? Um, especially like cleaning products around the house or using stuff like, um, uh, uh, what's that called? The hand sanitizer and whatnot. So what are some better options for more green cleaning? Okay. So this is an area that I love. Um, so Certain companies like Clorox and Lysol 
Lysol also being a uh, sponsor of the national PTA, which drives me absolutely crazy. Um, they have people convinced that that something's not clean unless it's Lysol clean, or it's got to smell like Lysol or Clorox in order to be clean. And they have people in living in fear of germs. And what we should be living in fear of is the chemicals that they are, you know, that we are buying um, that are supposed to make everything so sanitary and clean. Um, those chemicals cause hormone disruption. They cause, they're shown to cause cancer. I mean, there are, um, chemicals in uh, the cleaning products that are very harmful. So, so I recommend, first of all, never using disinfectant wipes unless there is a reason to disinfect. And so a reason to disinfect might be in the classroom, a child has vomited <laughs> or in the classroom, someone is bleeding. I mean, the, blood and vomit are reasons for disinfecting. Um, or if a, if, if like, kids in the classroom are coming down with the flu, then when all the kids are out of the classroom for a while, maybe at the end of the day, um, an adult can wipe things down with, let's say, a Lysol, with Lysol wipes or Clorox wipes. Um, but those, are, those should never be used by children, um, and they should really be used very sparingly by adults, not for regular cleaning. So for, for regular cleaning, Soap and water is what's recommended by the Washington State Department of Health. Um, and by soap, I don't mean like Dawn dishwashing detergent. I mean, or dishwashing soap. I mean like a, a non-toxic dish soap, um, all natural with no scent. Um, and, you know, using a cloth to clean it up or even using paper towels, it's better than a wipe. Because if you think about the life cycle thing again, you know, the wipe, you use it once, you throw it in the trash, and then it's... Um, it's kind of there forever. Um, and then hand sanitizer, um, there was a recent study that um, has shown um, that um, the that hand sanitizer does not clean as well, does not clean hands as well um, and protect against uh, the flu as well as washing your hands just with water. So that's not even with soap. So you're better off washing your hands just with water than you are using hand sanitizer. Um, and again, if, if you are using hand sanitizer, let's say there's a school field trip or, you know, you're out and you, you know, your kids for some reason really need to, to clean their hands. Um, the hand sanitizer doesn't exactly clean it, but if you need to do that, let's say you've used an outhouse or something, um, um, I just recommend getting something that has no scent, that has no fragrance. Yeah, there's been studies that have been coming out as well that uh, have been showing that putting hand sanitizer on your hands, you're absorbing it into your system through your skin, and then it's acting similar to an antibiotic on your microbiome because eventually it circulates to your microbiome and starts killing off uh, the microbiome in your gut. So there's a lot of impact um, to your body using hand sanitizer than what was previously thought. So that's definitely an interesting point. Absolutely. And, and um, with wipes, um, you it also, if somebody has asthma, you never, you don't want to be around any of that fragrance. Quaternary ammonium compounds are found in, you know, the, the disinfecting wipes and they can trigger an asthma attack. And then you talked about that, uh, sustainable practices isn't just um, recycling, which a lot of these options that we were talking about is kind of reusing and recycling uh, different things or finding a, a better alternative to it instead of having these out um, in the world anyways. But another part of sustainability is food and food waste. So can you talk a little bit about that as well? Um, sure. So um, we... Americans waste a tremendous amount of food, um, and and also that is built into our system of food production. Okay, with with um, food subsidies for corn, you know, for GMO corn farmers and for soy farmers, and you know there are um, subsidies that are built in that food is you know overproduced and. Um, fed to children in schools and a lot of that is going into the trash. So there's, there's food waste incorporated at all levels. So, um, 
but people can control that in their home environment. So I really encourage people to only buy what they're going to eat and then cook what they're going to eat or prepare what they're going to eat and to actually eat it. And if they don't eat it, you know, the next best thing to, you know, if you're not eating your food, giving it to someone who can eat it, if you, you're not doing that, giving it to an animal is the next best. So if you have a dog, that might be an easy thing to do. Um, um, and then after that, the next best thing would be composting. Um, yeah, but food waste is, you know, a big contributor to uh, climate change because food, um, wasted food comprises a, a lot of the, um, of what's in a landfill. And because of the conditions in the landfill, um, that food is not breaking down quickly. It's breaking down really slowly and um, it's releasing a lot of methane and methane is four times uh, more powerful as a greenhouse gas than, than carbon is. And I would also say uh, with all this excess food waste, that means we're uh, growing more food than we need mm -hmm. because of people just tossing all this food. And so if people were just getting what it is they need, then we might not have to grow as much, um, exactly. which would also help in the long run. And, 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 and that is also what people use to justify the use of, um, of GMOs and the use of uh, chemicals, you know, pesticides and Roundup and, um, they use that as an ex as an excuse saying, oh, we wouldn't be able to feed people. But if people just ate what <laughs> what they bought and we didn't waste as much food, then um, then I'll and also moving, shifting more to a plant based diet. I mean, I, I eat meat, but I just eat meat that is uh, grown without the use of any you know synthetic any hormones or antibiotics and um, meat that's what we call in our family happy meat. I mean, it's not necessarily happy when it's being slaughtered, but it's living a happy life while it's alive. And um, that's really important to our family. And um, it, it definitely makes it more challenging for sure. We can't just go anywhere to have dinner. You know, we have to look ahead and think about it a little bit more. Um, and depending upon where you live, that might be easier or harder. But um, moving to eating more plants and less meat is something that on a, again, on like a big picture level on a collective level can make a huge impact. Yeah. We, uh, a lot of the food that we have, we raise ourselves and the, the animals are happy their entire life mm -hmm. until the two second moment where it's all over. But up until that point, they have no idea what's going on and they have the best of lives. They get lots of food and they get to eat a lot of the scraps that we have if we have any type of scraps. So um, they definitely have it a lot better than commercially raised animals. That's for sure. That's wonderful. Oh, since you had mentioned uh, GMO foods and pesticides and whatnot, um, can you talk about some ways to make sure that you're getting glyphosate out of your food? And also, um, if organic foods are worth a little bit of extra cost? Okay, so organics are one way to get GMOs out of your diet, but there are a lot of people who can't necessarily afford um, or choose to spend their money in different ways rather than um, going 100% organic. So, um, you know, we, there are some uh, foods that are more heavily sprayed than others. And again, I would refer to the Environmental Working Group uh, website that has a list of the dirty dozen, basically the, the 12 fruits and vegetables that are most heavily sprayed. And then the clean, I don't know this year, if it, they, had, they change it every year, um, but it might be the clean 15 or something, the, the dozen or 15 or so foods that um, are not sprayed that much, typically like in a conventional setting. So um, if you want to pick and choose which ones you are um, eating organic, choosing organic with, um, I would go with those that are most heavily sprayed, choose those to be um, organic. Um, and then the clean ones, you know, maybe you'll choose organic or maybe not. Maybe it depends on what's on sale. Uh, you don't, it doesn't necessarily have to be organic 100% of the time. Obviously, if you live in a farming community and you know that there's a farm that doesn't spray or you go to a farmer's market and, you know, they tell you their story and they don't spray, um, but they're not certified organic. I mean, to me, I, I tend to trust and um, I will go with 
you know, I will buy the transitional farms food or the food from a place that's not necessarily certified organic, but they, they commit to sustainable farming practices. Yeah. And, and with meat, um, with me, I mean, you've already said it, you're doing what's ideal, right? Which is raising your own. Well, we're not raising our own, but we just choose meat that's grass fed, grass finished, you know, um, poultry that's raised without any uh, antibiotics, um, hormones, all of that. Yep. And a lot of small farms can't actually afford the cost to get certified certified organic because it can be ex extremely expensive. So, um, but a lot of times they are very open to people coming and checking out their farms too, especially if they're trying to sell some of their products. So you can go in and kind of take a look around and see how they are doing their practice and see if it's something that aligns with what you want to support, which is really nice. For sure. Are there any other uh, topics or ideas that you want to touch on before we talk about your projects going on at the Lake Washington School District? Um, yeah, sure. So one is, um, maybe the main one is cosmetics, because I think that's a place where a lot of people, especially women, but really everybody, um, people are exposed without thinking about it and without realizing it. So um, our cosmetics industry here, our, in our country, we have so little regulation around um, chemicals in, in all sorts of things, in, including body products and cosmetics. So with shampoos, conditioners, lotions, sunscreens, um, makeup, I mean, the list kind of goes on and on and on. Um, and in Europe, the regulations are a lot stricter. In fact, in most parts of the world, the regulations are a lot stricter than they are here. And so um, taking the time to find products that are that are clean, I think is really important. The, there's a company that's really doing a great job of that, I would say is Beauty Counter. Um, it's not, it, it's a, I don't know if it's considered a multi-level marketing company or not, but it's a, um, uh, it's something that, you know, you have a uh, somebody who you contact to order from, or you can do it all online, but it's beautycounter.com. Um, but they are actively lobbying um, Congress for stricter cosmetics regulations. Uh, and I really think that that says a lot there. They also have a partnership with Environmental Working Group now. And uh, they do a deeper dive into where cosmetics are coming from. And by cosmetics, I'm also referring to bath and body products. Um, but you can educate yourself a lot on their website as well. Awesome. Well, let's dive into some of the projects that you are working on at the Lake Washington School District because it can be tough to make changes at school. So I would love to hear how you've been able to successfully do that. Okay. So, um, I started planting seeds, um, not uh, sort of figurative seeds, um, a number of years ago and building relationships at one school and uh, building community. So getting involved um, with um, other people who share these values. And some of them didn't necessarily share the values at the beginning, but um, as we started working together, they learned more and more and, um, and now they share these values. Um, but I, I think a lot of the work that I've done has really been based on developing relationships and building trust at, at a school, at one school. And then my work expanded through the district. So, um, so I started as I mentioned before, I was a PTSA president and really built a lot of relationships through that and built a relationship with my principal and really built a relationship with my custodian who, who we just love the custodian. The custodian is sort of the person who is boots on the ground every day, um, who can make or break, uh, you know, some sustainability effort. So, um, having the, having the support of your custodian and supporting your custodian at a school is very important. Um, but then also I met with, um, with our school district's uh, lead person at the time in sustainability. And I had, by that time I had been sending emails and, you know, trying to get somewhere around sustainability issues with some other people at the school district. And it had been very challenging. 
Um, and so I was just really persistent. And there came a time where leadership changed at the district and new people came in and those new people had uh, were seeing things differently than the previous people. And it was a lot easier to start having meetings and talk about, you know, partnerships and how we can all work together. So um, sometimes it's really a matter of putting in the time, building a community around the issues that are important to you and figuring out which issues are the most important in your school community. So um, if the students at your um, school are really interested in climate change, that's what you want to focus on. I would say focusing, keeping it student centered is really valuable um, and can, I think, get you the most traction with parents um, because this is all about them. This is all about the kids. And so if we can help to empower them and support them to make changes, that is the most ideal way you can do it. Because as soon as one parent's telling another parent, you should do this, you should do that, that parent's shutting down. But if the kids are excited and they bring something home, a parent's much more open to hearing it. Um, the other um, group to really um, talk with are the teachers. Um, because the teachers are the ones who have the greatest impact on the kids. And the parents will listen to the teachers very often <laughs> where they might not listen to other parents. Um, and so finding which teachers are on board um, with different sustainability efforts and which ones. So um, which efforts? Um, there, are, there are so many different areas um, of potential interest within, within the umbrella of sustainability. So whether it's composting or waste reduction or single use plastics or, you know, uh, herbicide free schools, um, they're fragrance free, um, you know, lead. I mean, there are so many transportation. I mean, there's so many different areas. Um, so if you find people who are interested in any of those areas, I think just finding a place to start and building from there and not focusing too much on the big picture to start, but just on little successes. And if you can make those little, you know, make little changes at a school, you can then bring that to your school district and start having the conversation at that level. And so can you talk about some of the, the small changes that you were able to implement um, in the school district and some of your accomplishments in there as well? Um, sure, so um, last year was my first year serving as the Lake Washington School District uh, PTSA Sustainability Chair. So um, I started um, in the last fall, so a year ago last fall, and now we have, um, now, as you've mentioned, we have chairs at 30 schools. So, um, so we meet, I meet regularly with monthly with um, the school district's sustainability lead. And then we, the 30 chairs, not all of them usually show up, but a lot of them do. Um, we meet monthly as well. And the district usually sends at least one representative to that. So, um, Last year, I brought in um, a woman I know who works for the US EPA, and I also brought in a woman I know who works for Northwest Center for Alternatives to Pesticides. So I brought them into some meetings with the school district um, to talk about um, green cleaning, and, um, and then the other one um, to talk about um, getting out glyphosate, which is the um, cancer-causing uh, component in Roundup, but it's also in other uh, pesticide herbicides. So we had these conversations and one thing that the district decided to do is to take glyphosate, pro products containing glyphosate, this herbicide, um, out, of, out of the district. So they eliminated um, that, which was terrific. So now none of our schools are sprayed with glyphosate. Um, another thing they did is they they are putting no idle zone signs up at every school uh, so parents will know and students will know that it's important not to idle basically if you're if you're going to be somewhere more than 10 seconds you should be shutting off your car it's a, it's a misunderstanding that it takes more energy to restart your car and causes more pollution but really if it's more than 10 seconds just shut your car off um they also did a food share pilot and we did 
did that in collaboration with the King County Green Schools program, which is this amazing program here in King County. Uh, and what was what's currently still happening is a lot of the food that students take from the lunch line ends up in the trash or even in the compost, but it is not being eaten. So um, they did with the city of Seattle, King County Green Schools in our district did a food share pilot at five schools to try to figure out how to save uh, food from going into the trash or compost by having a share table. So if a kid, let's say, takes an apple or more likely takes a piece of um, fruit that could be peeled. So let's say an orange or takes a, a milk and they don't open it at all. They could put it on a share table and another child who wants that food could come and take it from the share table. Anything that's left over would go into a fridge and that would be picked up by a local organization that helps to feed families who are hungry. Um, just if so it like it satisfies so many different areas, right? You're feeding hungry people and you are keeping food out of the landfill. Um, we are also, our district is also um, giving stipends to green team leaders who would be staff, teachers and staff at all of our elementary schools. So that encourages participation by, by um, teachers and staff in sustainability projects. Um, they've formed a green advisory team and I'll be sitting on that. Um, so there are a lot of different areas where we've made progress in other areas where we're still, we're still working. So um, waste reduction is going to be a big focus for us this year and single use plastics and, um, and also green cleaning and um, yeah. And, a few other issues. Yeah, I think the the stuff you've already accomplished is absolutely amazing. Amazing, and I know there's a lot of people that would probably be interested in um, uh, trying to figure out ways to get this into their own school district. So, what would be a good place for people to find you or reach out to you to uh, talk about different ways they can get uh, more sustainable practices in their schools? I would be happy to have people email me. I would love to build more of a coalition um, of sustainability chairs, especially through PTSA um, across the country. So if anybody wants to email me, uh, my email, my personal email address is stephlacoven at outlook.com. And um, I would prefer if possible to have it be focused um, on schools um, because that's my main area of focus now. Um, that that would be terrific. But I I also tend to have some sort of presence at our PTA state convention in Washington State. And um, and if you're if anybody who's listening is involved in our in the Lake Washington School District or any of the school districts in Washington State, I would really um, love to talk with them about. Um, sustainability efforts in, in their district or at their school. Awesome, Stephanie. Well, thank you so much. Is there any final things you want to say before we fully wrap up here? Mm -hmm. Oh, I would just say it, this can all be overwhelming sometimes, even for me. And uh, this is what I'm living and breathing every day. It can be overwhelming. And so I find it to be less overwhelming when I can do something about it. And so that's what gets me to jump into action and um, having a support system. So being surrounded by people who um, not just share these values, but also who feel uh, inspired to act on them and to advocate. Uh, I, I think it's really important to have that support system set up because otherwise you can get burnt out really quickly. And we're in this for the long haul. This is about our kids and this is about the future of our whole world. So um, I encourage you to find your inspiration and to make little changes and to stay supported and to advocate, to talk to your city council members, to talk to your state legislators. Um, don't think for a second that your word doesn't matter and that your voice doesn't matter. It really, really does. They, they will listen if enough people are speaking up. Awesome, Stephanie. Well, I I totally think all of this is extremely important, which is why I brought you on. And I think you did a fantastic job of breaking down even the small changes we can make that make a huge impact. And like you said, um, just one person having a glass bottle for a decade saved so many uh, 
you know, tons of bottled water that could be in the landfills or in the oceans or anywhere, really. So one person really can make a pretty big impact. And if we all start jumping on board here, then uh, we can make some significant changes in the world. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. I hope this episode gave you some ideas on what you can swap out in your own daily life that would be a little bit more eco-friendly. And we don't have to change everything we do, but even a small change like a reusable water bottle can save hundreds to thousands of single-use plastic bottles. And we mentioned a lot of different resources in this episode, so you can find all of those resources at summitforwellness.com slash 94. Remember, you have the chance to win a $100 gift card by filling out our podcast survey, and it should take you less than two minutes to complete. So go to summitforwellness.com slash survey to fill it out. Next week, we have a fun episode where we talk about different ways to improve your sexual function. So let's go learn a little bit about Summer Beatty. I am here with Dr. Summer Beatty. Hey, Dr. Beatty, what is one unique thing about you that most people don't know? <laughs> so a lot of people don't know that I grew up in a logging camp living in um, a trailer um, on an island in Alaska. I was actually born in Alaska and um, had actually been back, practiced, I had gone back and forth and practiced in Alaska as well. So Alaska is definitely home to me. And um, I think I'm a little bit quirky, maybe just based on the type of community and isolation that I grew up in, in this logging camp and small little native fishing village on Chichikov Island. That's awesome that you keep going back up there. Uh, that's yeah. so cool. Alaska definitely has a unique draw. Um, they say, you know, you can take you can take someone out of Alaska, but you never take Alaska out of them. And I know they say that about other states, but definitely it's true for Alaska. Well, what will we be learning about in our interview together? Yeah, so you and I are going to kind of go over just what PRP is, how we're using it in orthopedics and sexual health for men and women, and like what some of the considerations are for who is and isn't a good candidate for receiving those treatments. And what are your favorite foods or nutrients that you think everyone should get more of in their diet? Yeah, so, you know, obviously as a naturopathic physician, I want people predominantly eating a whole foods diet, organic when possible, non-GMO, avoiding pesticides. But when it comes to supplements, um, my three favorite are typically collagen because I'm doing a lot of orthopedic care and I will need to be rebuilding tissue. And then vitamin D. I feel like everyone who lives here in the Pacific Northwest especially should be on some sort of vitamin D supplement and monitoring their levels. But we even see low vitamin D in sunny climates too. And then I think probiotics. I think that our environment puts a huge assault on our uh, microbiome. And one way to help remedy that is by using a good probiotic at home. And what are your top three health tips for anyone who wants to improve their overall wellness? Well, <laughs> three is very limiting, but um, <laughs> I, I think that relationships probably are my first go-to. If you don't have good, strong, healthy, loving, supportive relationships and a community of support, I think all of the other things that you do for health and wellness are going to fall short. I think that people are designed to be in relationship and community and thrive in that. Um, but aside from that, I would say food, your diet is always king. Um, exercise is clean. And then getting good quality sleep is probably the three like physical things that people should be doing to improve their overall wellness. 